I'd like to begin with some really basic questions about the metaphysics of time, just to get us started. And Craig, since I know you've written about this, not that recently now, since your book, What Makes Time Special, came out in, in 2017 now, but I thought we, we should start with McTaggart and his A and B series of time. And can you just walk me or us, my listeners, I mean, Tim doesn't need this through, just what this is? Sure. Uh, yeah, so McTaggart was a Scottish philosopher. Um, interestingly, his middle name was also McTaggart. So he was John Ellis McTaggart McTaggart. Uh, and yeah, in 1908, he published this paper, which then really uh, was a big kind of hit in philosophy of time, or maybe even started what we might think of as kind of analytic, you know, analytic philosophies uh, take on the metaphysics of time. And he distinguishes a, a bunch of different ways you can think about time. And so um, you can think about time as, you know, if we think about a sequence of, of moments, and so we're not thinking about relativity or anything, uh, if we think of a sequence of moments, you know, you could order them with a betweenness relation, say which ones are between one another. You could order them. Uh, you could say which ones are earlier than other ones. And so, if you order them all by the earlier than relation, you know, then you get what McTaggart called the B series. Um, now, if you then order them a different way with these kind of, so that's all sort of a bunch of relations, just looking at all the different relations between the, uh, the different moments. But if you use the different sort of vocabulary, you know, uh, you could uh, order them a different way. And so you could order them in terms of past, present, and future. And so in cognitive linguistics, which we call a, a, a didactic uh, uh, structure, and so this makes reference to a, a special now uh, or spe you know a didactic center. And so you could order everything in terms of past, present, and future. And you can see there's a kind of difference because you know nat what's now is indexical, and so it might you know depending on when you say it. But, different events might be past, present, or future. Whereas, you know, Socrates drinking hemlock was is always before Socrates' death. No matter, you know, it was before it before that event happened, when it was in the past, when it was in the future, when it was present, when it was now in the past. And so the truth value of the A theoretic properties, past, present, and future, sort of change with um, change with, you know, when the utterance is. Uh, whereas um, in uh, with the B theory, that's sort of you know timeless. Now the way I think about it is that you know one is you know so what you know, I think you know so McTaggart then used this distinction and he said you know that there was he made this famous argument that time is ideal, and he argued that um, all events had to have both A properties and B properties. And that it didn't have A properties, it wasn't really time, and then he. Kind of tries to show a incoherence, um, but to me, you know, the I guess the the lasting thing that, of interest there is really that you know, we we you know human beings and probably animals too do carve up the world in this a theoretic structure. This, we use this didactic structure, and so my book I call it manifest time and try to get away from all the kind of a versus b stuff. Uh, but it is still very important to the way we think about time. Uh, so we we do carve it up into past, present, and future. We tend to attribute different properties to them so we don't think of the past as something we can change. There's no button I can wiggle that will change where I was born. Um, we tend to think of the future as open, ripe with possibility. And then we think of that tripartite structure of past, present, and future as updating and changing. And so yeah, I, I call that the flow of time, but that's like the least clear ter, ter, uh, uh, phrase in philosophy, really, because people, all, so many people mean different things by it. But I just think of this kind of updating didactic structure. Yeah, so then when you get into the metaphysics, so none of that has anything to do with metaphysics, really. That's just sort of different concepts we use when we talk about time. But then, you know, a lot of metaphysicians then said, you know, we must 
find a metaphysics that respects the the atheoretic structure, and so then come you know then there are uh, presentists and I don't know what the right word is becomingists or possibleists uh, who then craft a kind of metaphysics. There's really like you know just dozens and dozens and dozens of these views, uh, almost as many as there are analytic metaphys- metaphysicians of time. And then uh, you know that's usually contrasted with then the the, the so called B theorists who sometimes called the block theory, um, and then you know the, the, historically that's been always there's been this kind of dispute between the two camps. Um, I myself uh, uh, am not actually a hundred percent enough of a metaphysician to even think that the two camps are two camps. Uh, that they might actually just be the same camp, really, uh, the two different ways of speaking. Yeah, can I can I actually just jump here? I mean, I think I think Craig is giving a perfectly accurate historical summary of how a lot of this has been taken, or or the the labels people have stuck on themselves and on their opponents. Um, but I think there are some things worth pointing out. I mean, w- the first thing worth pointing out is that as far as McTaggart goes, he wasn't A versus B at all. Um, the structure of his argument is the A series, he claimed, is incoherent. And the B series presupposes the A series, ergo the B series is incoherent, right? He wasn't pumping for one. And then then you've got to drop down to the C series, which very few people talk about, which is... Um, the first one that just to lay out all the events in the universe and only order them by betweenness. So there's no asymmetric structure there, right? Um, because if, if, if B is between A and C, then equally B is between C and A. Um, and the, the idea that, that there are two different things, A and B, I mean, there's the linguistic resource you get when you have Daxis. That is an indexical. That is a token reflexive thing, like here or now. Um, to to make the analogy, you have a map of the United States, and you can kind of look at the map and notice just from the map that this town is near that town. Um, but if someone just asks at a certain moment, "Gee, is is such and such a town near?" What we do is we fill that in. You know, that's at, at, with here. Um, which is which is an indexical, right? Is it near the place where I am right now? And then from the map, you can tell, right? You haven't really added anything. You haven't added anything to geography, right? You haven't added anything to reality. You have some token reflexive indexic, indexical linguistic things. Um, given the B series and an indexical, I'll give you an A series. And if you give me, if the indexical sticks down at a different point, it'll give me a different A series. That is you know, relative to Socrates' death, certain other events were near in the future, to the near future, and some to the near past, like his trial. Um, Right now, his trial is pretty far in the past, as is his death. None of this is puzzling, right? None of that is odd. None of that should require any much thought at all. The real question is, is there a fundamental asymmetric before and after relation in terms of which we distinguish the past direction from the future direction, and therefore, at any given moment, the future of that moment from the past of that moment. Um, the C series kinds of denies that. Um, that strikes me as being quite odd. Um, I don't think there's actually anything in physics that suggests that. Yeah, I agree with you about the. Uh, yeah, that the yeah the A and the B are complementary, and it's just really about indexicals uh, and yeah their only mystery is why a heck philosophy went for like 40 or 50 years think, thinking uh, that you know the main argument uh, you know was trying to reduce the ace you know so the the game was for a long time was can you say a theoretic stuff using only the resources of the B theory and you know that's a, a mugs game because you can't do that with personal pronouns you can't do that with spatial here you can't do that with anything and so you know you're going to lose if you try to play that but that doesn't mean you lost in any way because you shouldn't have been playing that game so 
Uh, just to make sure that I'm following completely. So are the A theory and B theory, they're not really metaphysically loaded, but just concerned with how we conceive of time and then the further more metaphysically committed categories. I think, Craig, you mentioned presentism and where only the present is real and then possibilism where the past and present are real. And then I don't think you mentioned eternalism, but where all three are real in some sense. These categories are just layered over the A theory, the B theory, and the C theory, depending on which, if any, uh, we adopt. Yeah, that's the way it's typically taken. Uh, yeah, I mean, can I just again, just linguistically make a comment here? McTaggart doesn't use the terms A theory and B theory. He uses the terms A series and B series. The, the, the B series is all the events that ever have happened, are happening, or will happen laid out with a before, with a earlier, later relation on them. Presumably also with the distance, like how much time, but he doesn't really talk about that. Um, the, at an A series, there's only one B series. There's only one, okay? An A series is all the events that ever happened laid out with one of them indicated as now. Um, some indicated as to the near future of now, some to the distant future, some to the near past, and some to the distant past. So you just take the B series and stick a pin in it somewhere, and it'll give you an A series. And if you stick the pin somewhere else, it'll give you a different A series. Those are two different theories, right? They're just not, I mean, they're not theories of anything. <laughs> they're just series. Uh, the, the reason that McTaggart thinks he can get a contradiction out of the A series is because he calls it the A series as if there's only one of them when obviously there are infinitely many of them. You just stick the pin in any, any of infinitely many different places and you get a different A series. So if you, if you mess that up and think there's only one of them, then it's not too surprising you can get contradictions. Bruce. Yeah, Tim's right that yeah, it's, it's interesting to look at the history of why, where did the eight properties end up becoming the eight theory and then, yeah, you know, somewhere in my book, I've got a, a canonical statement from you know, the 1960s or something of the eight theory, and I point out that it's got a, you know, the, there was like three or four claims. One was, you know, there's like one or two semantic, one or two, you know, metaphysical, and one or two epistemic, and it was this kind of weird grab bag of of theses that people psychologically associated with one another, but. They were completely logically detachable. And now, Craig, in our correspondence, you mentioned that you thought that Tim sometimes sounds like a, an A theorist, yet you think he's a B theorist. And I was wondering um, why that is and, and how this relates to whether there is an objective now. And how Tim well, feels about yeah. this. So, well, in some of Tim's writings on time, uh, you know, he, uh, Tim, you know, Tim's a great philosopher, and he's also rhetorically gifted. And so there are these rhetorical flourishes, of, you know, motivating his views on time. Uh, and sometimes I think he dips his dips his toes into the uh, to uh, the kind of theoretic intuitions to try to motivate uh, his view. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you do recognize that in yourself, Tim? Or, or well, as I just said, I don't recognize it's between the A theory and the B theory. So I don't. I, I wouldn't recognize an intuition as being either A or B. I see the difference. You know, I let, let me actually just state. I was just talking to some other people here in Lugano about this. Here are two questions that are just yes, no, clear questions people can disagree on. One is: Is there? a universal moment, such a thing like a universal moment of time, the way Newton thought there was, what we call absolute simultaneity, or an objective foliation of space-time, okay? Uh, and we can explain, if you want, Craig or I could explain what that is, but you can just ask, do you believe in that? That's a question. Here's another question. Is there a fundamental temporal asymmetry between the future direction and the past direction? The C theory really denies that, and both the A and B series presuppose it. Those questions I understand, but I don't see a difference between A and B. So if you tell me I'm using A intuitions to promote what's really a B theory, I honestly don't understand what you're accusing me of. Because I say over and over again, I, 
give me a B series, I'll give you as many A series as you like. Give me an A series and I'll extract the B series from it. I don't see these as competing. So I'm not quite sure what the accusation is, right? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So, uh, well, we, 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 well, yeah. So maybe I should point out for viewers, uh, I think Tim and I are pretty, you know, in the 1% of philosophers who agree on this point that the A and the B are really just not at odds, but are just sort of two ways of describing the same reality. Uh, so probably most people in philosophy would disagree with us. So we agree on that. Yeah. And so then, well, I was just thinking, I don't know, I don't have a passage in front of me or something, but uh, just, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, flow of time talk, if if it sort of goes into, if it sort of dips into, um, uh, and probably you don't do this maybe, but like existence talk, you know, where the past exists and the future is doesn't exist or something. Yeah, I don't like. say that. I absolutely don't say that. I think the future, there is there was exactly one past and there will be exactly one future and that the totality of, of all reality is that unique past and the unique present and the unique future. And I don't see, uh, I, I don't see a metaphysical difference between those. Oh, yeah. Well, so then, yeah, then, well, that's interesting because that, that's what I thought you thought, but I was... <laughs> I was curious though. 